Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Ryan Rackley, and I'll be facilitating today's event. I'm a partner with ISG, Information Services Group, a global research and advisory firm. I have 20 plus years of experience in technology services and digital transformation, and I have a passion for data and for cloud, which makes today's discussion of particular interest for me, and I hope for you too. We're gonna to spend the next little bit of time talking about transforming data architectures by migrating data warehouse to cloud. We'll talk about the trends driving the rise in cloud service adoption. We'll talk about the increasing complexity of business problems and the value that partners bring in accelerating transformation. Our panel from Brilio and AWS will share the challenges that they've met and the client success stories that they've enabled. Our speakers today include Hari, Rahul, and Martin, who will introduce themselves here and get us kicked off. Hari, let's start with you, and we'll move on to Rahul and then Martin. Sure. Thanks, Ryan. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, call me as Hari. So I'm Hari Krishnasan. I lead the Data Engineering Center of Excellence for Brilio globally. Uh, very, very passionate about data, especially on data warehouses, and coming with around 23 years of experience uh, with a kind of you know uh, data delivery architecture, enterprise architecture uh, experience. We are a very fast growing team with very passionate about digital and data. And we cut across multiple areas of data services like data strategy, modernization, data science, visualization, and business analytics, and um, data analysis. Happy to be here with our esteemed partner, AWS, with whom we drive various initiatives globally especially on data modernization. And we'll definitely touch upon that uh, later part of this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you all. And uh, definitely uh, looking forward in terms of talking to you about some of the very important features of Redshift, especially which has helped us a lot with our clients in gaining momentum in the business. And I have my colleague here, Rahul, and I'll pass it out to you. Thank you so much, Hari. Uh, good morning, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Rahul Das. I am a senior solution architect within the data analytics and engineering practice here at Brilio. Um, I came into the whole data industry, especially at a very interesting time when digital transformation was the byword and the keyword. And, and enterprises were discovering what were the advantages and also the uh, key guardrails as on when digital uh, became the buzzword in the industry. Uh, and I've seen that shift from enterprises becoming digital and, and then talking about the debt of digital, where because if data is not there and data is not modernized, any systems of insight which powers any digital transformation may become irrelevant. Uh, so happy, very, very uh, interested and, and uh, you know uh, looking forward to this webinar. Uh, the, the work that we are doing with AWS specific to data modernization of warehouses uh, is is at the cornerstone of our uh, strategy with respect to how we are taking clients on our data on cloud transformation. So very, very interested, um, looking forward to participate uh, in this webinar and thank you so much. Well, over to you, Martin, thank you. Thank you very much, Rahul. Well, um, welcome everyone. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, happy to be here with you today. My name is Martin Alvarez. I am a um, data warehouse specialist with AWS. Um, I basically dedicate uh, my time to work with our customers um, and help them find solutions also with our partners like Radio uh, to find solutions to their data warehouse needs. Um, I'm very happy to be with you today. Um, I started my career in the beginning of the 90s, right? Early 90s. And at the time, the concept of centralizing um, data coming from operational databases into large relational data stores for analytical purposes was relatively a new trend. Um, data warehousing and decision support systems back then were in their infancy. Uh, and back then, most of the discussions were centered around how to deal with the limitations that at the time the technology had to store all these data in limited amounts of storage, right? Uh, remember that we are basically talking back then about megabytes um, and uh, very large databases were scratching the gigabytes. Well, that was more than 30 years ago, right? Um, over the last 30 years uh, of my career, we have seen very exciting things. The last 10 had been quite, quite um, 
well, you know, um, impressive, right? Awesome. Um, we have seen a lot of new technologies coming and changing the way we perceive data, the way we, we handle data, the access that we have to data. And I am very happy to share with you what we are doing at AWS to, um, you know, to help um, our customers with the help of our partners to tackle down the requirements um, when it comes to now the new trends um, on data. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, guys. We're going to spend most of our time today in a Q&A format where I will ask questions and the gentlemen will come up with answers. Um, but before we do that, we're going to do a little bit of level setting first. And I'd like to unpack some of the trends that make this an important topic. Rahul, I'd like to start with you, and then we can swing around to Martin. So Rahul, tell us how you think about it from Brilio's perspective. Sure. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, so our point of view is, um, what we are seeing in the market right now, that there are three key drivers, or let's say three key patterns, uh, which, which are enabling this, this transformation, uh, this modernization of data warehousing on cloud. Um, and, and that's typically happening because um, organizations want to do more. Um, I think with the advent of uh, new patterns in data consumption, with the advent of data democratization, with the advent of users becoming more and more conversant and more and more um, dependent on the type of data that they want to do their own hypothesis, to do their self-service analysis, uh, with the advent of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, organizations are slowly but surely realizing that they can do much, much more um, with their data as opposed to um, canned reporting and on static dashboards. So this expansion of data consumption is definitely fueling uh, the move towards modernization of a data warehouse. And cloud definitely is the target for that. Um, the second driver that we see is organizations have absolutely discovered uh, the, the uh, core advantage of cloud, which is uh, ability to be responsive, to be agile, uh, to changing demands, changing needs to different periodicities in business. Uh, so that's where uh, I think the increase in responsiveness, the increase in agility is absolutely driving organizations to set up their own, um, um, I would say, uh, strategic BI and analytical cells that will drive specific uh, uh, decision insights uh, within their specific business area. So that that definitely is uh, taking a lot of uh, steam. Uh, the third driver that we definitely see is the evolution of data architectures, right? So uh, organizations are slowly but surely realizing that the move from a monolithic architecture to, to let's say a microservices based architecture is something which is driving, is, is being driven because uh, business is moving at the speed of light, right? So in, in this kind of an environment, there will exist two different personas, right? So we will have one persona who, who has to cater to create uh, organized, controlled, um, and ensure that the data is controlled in such a way that only applicable people have access to that because that data is critical. It supports BIU. It is uh, compliant to multiple regulations, right? So that data needs to be controlled. That persona needs to be satisfied. But at the same time, you also have... Uh, what I call as evangelists, right? So as in people who want to explore the data, people who want to find out new truth from the, uh, from uh, let's say stale data or let's say dark data, right? So these people who are exploring, who are the super users, who are your data analysts or your business analyst will not be waiting for, uh, for the standard pipelines to give them the data that they need because they have to ideate, they have to hypo uh, you know, build their own hypothesis. So this exploration, uh, the balance between these people who are exploring and the balance between people who want to be uh, you know, in their own BAU is, is something that needs to be managed. And that is where, again, organizations are moving to cloud, uh, taking their systems of insight to get that power and ensure that that balance comes, right? So we see definitely these three drivers powering the data warehousing strategy and, and all of that is currently being driven on cloud. Uh, Martin, uh, I would also like to understand from you, um, how is this currently being done on AWS? What are the trends that you are seeing um, specific to the areas that I spoke, spoke about, let's say data democratization? Yes, yes. Well, you know, um, Rahul, everything that you mentioned is something that obviously um, with, with, with um, 
let's call it with our AWS <laughs> flavor, right? But it's something that we also perceive, right? Um, analytics at scale um, gives organizations the flexibility to align with new capabilities, with existing capabilities, but mostly what you call, um, you know, uh, data democratization. Uh, the key here is to cover for the user needs, different skill level, right? The, the community of users is more diverse day by day, right? 30 years ago, the users of the data were very, uh, were, uh, very specifically defined, right? And over the last 10 years, more and more users inside organizations have come with new use cases for the data. So certainly we need to address these different skill levels, these different capabilities, and obviously these different expectations. Um, so we call these um, the challenges of data analytics at scale. Um, I, I have a slide here that basically summarizes those those challenges of data analytics at scale, right? Um, if we if we show the slide, and um, essentially what we see here is um, the need for integration of diverse data, the need to address the performance that that users require, and obviously address all this on their the right cost, right? Because um, for example, on the first in the first part, we, when we talk about integrating all these diverse data, this is what we have been calling a time on and off the big data, um, the big data paradigm, right? Or, or the big data definition, which is, you can call it with what many views you want, right? Variability, var um, uh, volume, velocity, etc. But essentially what we're seeing here is obviously access to a very diverse variety of data right from different sources not anymore just relational databases right we have seen this happening over the last 10 15 years but with that comes our obviously multiple needs for analytics there is the need for diverse types of analytics diverse type of analysis and with all that customers want to have faster access to their insights right with all this volume that we are receiving that increases day by day, the demand for velocity also increases. It's not anymore a cool thing to wait two minutes for a query, right? We want to have the result in a matter of seconds, milliseconds if possible. And this comes to the next, to the next set of challenges, which is the technology has to be performant. It has to uh, be able to deliver the insights faster, but making it easy for the for the um, operators of the technology to use it, right? So the, the, the systems have to be easy to use, override all that difficult to manage them. And all this has to also be a scalable, right? Scaling is something that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we were okay if it took us two weeks to get a new, a new resource to increase the, the capability of our our system, but now we want to do this in a matter of minutes, again, seconds if possible. And all this under a, um, a situation where, where costs have to be predictable. We don't want unpredictable costs. We don't want inflexible tools. And we certainly want to make sure that we are safe, that our data is secure and everything is compliant. So all these new challenges, right, uh, take us for, for new trends. And these new trends are we want serverless technologies, we want easy to use systems, we want a scalable and elastic systems using the advantages of the cloud, right? Um, we want to make sure that all this is, is uh, the right amount of cost for the user, depending on their size and utilization. In other words, we don't want to pay uh, a large amount of money just to get the solution as we were willing to do maybe 20 years ago. We now, want to be able to turn on and off the billing depending on when we're using um, our technology, right? So paying on demand, using the advantages that the cloud technologies provide us to be able or capable to do so. Um, on top of all that, these, um, these systems, right, have to be capable to cater to different needs 
of the users and the data has to be available, right? It has to be ubiquitous, has to be available to all these different applications. It's not a good idea anymore to silo the data behind a, a system because we have so many different services. We have diff so many different tools. We have so many different user communities that want to take advantage of the data. So all these are the trends. Systems have to be capable to deliver you know, scalability is of use, have to be, um, you know, av available on demand, and they have to be accessible in cost. And, and at AWS, we keep defining our strategies and the, the new features of our services to achieve those requirements. We keep evolving them. We will talk a little bit about our, our data warehouse service, which is Redshift. And what is that we are doing to address those requirements in a little bit more? Um, but yeah, that's what we are seeing. That's what the trends that we are seeing. These are the challenges that we are addressing with our technologies. Very interesting. Uh, no shortage of challenges to be addressed. So let's move on to the questions if we can. And we're gonna pick up right on that topic of challenges. Data warehouse migrations to the cloud are challenging for organizations, in part because of the large volume of stakeholders that are involved. You both just talked about the communities of users. A friend of mine put it this way, the organization has antibodies to this work. So my question is, how do you go about addressing that complexity and the dysfunction? And Hari, let's start with you. Yeah. So thank you for asking this question, uh, Noreen. Um, Martin has touched up touched upon a lot of um, important areas and some of the challenges as well. So let me uh, re-emphasize uh, some of these challenges that we come across on a day-to-day -day basis uh, when we engage with our uh, esteemed clients, right? So one is definitely the assessment of the current IT systems. Uh, the current IT systems may be very complex, may be customized, highly customized, and the initial assessment and definitely an auto discovery uh, is a very important aspect and a very important challenge. And, you know, um, in fact, many of the data modernization, data migration um, projects may be having a stumbling block initially on these areas. So if you look at us that to ease this, what we have done is that we have developed our automated discovery tool and we use it very um, you know, uh, very, very often with all our client engagements. And the second part is basically to, um, you know, in terms of to identify what to modernize and what to, what, what, what need to be, uh, what we need to leave behind, right? So which piece of data need to be modernized or which piece of data need to be migrated? So this question need to be answered uh, by stakeholdering with various business stakeholders, IT stakeholders, uh, the whole uh, no, uh, population. So identifying that part is another you know, big challenge. The data taxonomy, uh, classifying them, um, getting the stakeholder approval, I think all those areas is very, very important. Uh, and aligning with the business is very, very important, right? And the third part of the third challenge is basically in terms of data security, right? So all of us know that data management and data security is very, uh, very, very critical, especially when you look at the kind of compliance frameworks, law of the land, right? Governing a lot of data, right? So that is where I think the uh, when we have the partnerships with, uh, uh, with AWS, and also if you look at the kind of security features that Redshift is supporting, uh, all of them really uh, know, helping us in terms of mitigating uh, the security challenges. Because nowadays we have a very, very specific security um, you know, tools, uh, th three levels or four levels of security, including the data, anonymizing the data, uh, making sure that the PI data has been uh, secure, either the data is, whether the data is in motion, whether the data is in rest, right? So uh, we have all those features uh, available with our cloud data warehouses. Uh, and I'm sure that Martin will touch upon some of these features in the upcoming, you know, uh, sessions when he do. And the, the last one is especially in terms of the automation and tools capabilities. Um, so automation and tools capabilities is a big challenge because many a times, you know, when you look at the current data estate, which need to be migrated, uh, there may be a lot of 
open source tools that may be in use, right? So how do you make sure that you know when you move this data into a cloud base, you automate? How do you, for example, how do you do the compatibility testing? How do you make sure that all of your data, which is currently um, currently available in the on-premise system or your source system, is successfully migrated and available for the business consumption uh, in the cloud, right? So that quality assurance becomes a very, very important thing. And you cannot really go with a manual uh, you know, testing mechanism there because definitely you need to have automated you know, tools uh, there. Auto validation is very, very important because you have to make sure that all the business rules that has been governing the data, your existing data is still available uh, in your uh, new estate. It's Thank really you. insightful. Thank you for that. My second question is around the word migration. To me, it makes me want to think things are simple, but it's actually a great deal of complexity in migrating a data warehouse to the cloud. Can you elaborate on the work beyond the migration itself? Can you open the aperture on the work to actually migrate a data warehouse to the cloud? And Rahul, I'm going to ask you to respond to that one. Sure. Thanks a lot, Ryan. So, uh... Let me answer it by uh, first touching upon the question uh, that you asked first, right? Uh, and you mentioned that organizations have antibodies to this kind of a work. Uh, and, and when you say work, uh, the word migration starts first, right? So I think I think the key challenge that we have seen as, as part of doing this uh, with a number of our clients uh, is that the art of the possible is, uh, is, is always missing. Um, so is it migration? Uh, is it a lift and shift journey? Uh, we don't think so, right? So it is not a migration exercise. A data warehouse going to cloud uh, doesn't have to be and shouldn't be a migration exercise. And that's where we definitely believe that having a bright start uh, to understand why it is not a migration exercise is superbly important. Uh, we definitely think it is more of a transformation as opposed to a migration. Migration is one of the key components of this transformation exercise, uh, but it is not the um, only component, right? So we definitely think, like Hari mentioned, uh, that as on when you do this, uh, it has to be a complete re-architecture on cloud because legacy data warehouses were built and architected uh, to support compute and storage together. They were coupled compute and storage. But now on cloud, uh, with the advent of uh, separation of compute and storage, with the advent of how you could use serverless technologies on cloud, there is a lot of, um, let's say, modular architecture that you can build in. With that comes in uh, the, the direct point that how do you then ensure that something which has been built to be really tightly coupled uh, becomes decoupled on cloud. And that's why we definitely believe that it is a re-architecture story as opposed to being a limited shift. Uh, so what are the key things that have to be addressed, right? So Hari mentioned one aspect, like, you know, do a deep discovery. Uh, why do we need to do a deep, deep discovery? We need to do a deep discovery because we need to completely flesh out and understand what is the sprawl of data within the current uh, legacy instance that I have. Uh, what is the sprawl of my workloads? What is the sprawl of my reports? Uh, if I am running an inefficient system on premise, taking that to cloud is not going to give me any answers or any business value. It will still be an inefficient system, maybe an even more inefficient system on cloud because cloud demands that you know uh, when to switch off the lights and where to switch off the lights, right? So if you don't know that and you are running an inefficient system, uh, it's going to be doubly inefficient, right? So it is superbly important that that discovery is done on, on the legacy instance. Um, and that starts the transformation exercise for us. Uh, once you have done that discovery, it is important that you also determine and identify what the target state will look on cloud. So in this case, uh, let's take AWS, right? So if the target on AWS for a legacy warehouse, uh, let's take Teradata is going to be Redshift, uh, that's not going to be the end of the discussion or the end of the architecture, right? What are going to be the supply chain components of that end-to-end -end architecture? How will the data be ingested? How will that be curated? Uh, should I keep a uh, swimline architecture to ensure that I, uh, I have data, applicable data pushed into Redshift as opposed to, let's say, all the data pushed into Redshift, right? So, so 
discovery and and identification of the right state architecture is definitely going to help me in this exercise um, but then comes the word migration right so how do you achieve this as part of a migration exercise right that is where we definitely believe doing this big bang um, is is where most organizations definitely fail uh, doing this in a phased wise a uh, priority based approach where you identify priority you identify criticality and you take baby steps uh, on 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 the cloud platform definitely is is a greater path or a better path to success uh, once you have done that then comes the industrialization right so that is where you can set up factory models to ensure that you do this rapidly iteratively iteratively uh, you know using an agile pod based method Uh, but there are other things also to ensure uh, that this becomes more of a, a value driven long drawn transformation exercise because you are addressing also core challenges that might have seeped into the data warehouse uh, let me take an example of let's say data quality data governance so if you have faulty governance if your data is not uh, trustworthy in your let's say legacy data instance uh, it will always be a challenge as a mid move to cloud right so how do you ensure that you have a layer of governance around data not only technical governance but also stewardship around data how you touched upon the capabilities that would have to be evolved right so how do you ensure that a data capability or an operating model is created to govern the structures around data to govern and to ensure that people who are operating that data working on that data know what are the things to do what are the things to operate on and finally the thing that we definitely see is when to switch off your on premise right so you have moved to cloud but you definitely need to switch off on premise because you keep on you cannot keep on running both the systems so how do you ensure that that is done seamlessly as on when let's say your modernization exercises uh, also happen parallelly on cloud right so we definitely feel that it's it's not a migration story a migration story is lift and shift right but this is definitely a much much more broader than migration and that's why we call this as modernization uh, which will give you long term transformation right i think it's it's a transformative exercise which is where we be, believe that long term value needs to be achieved and how it needs to be achieved is what i just mentioned uh, through the set of uh, let's say multiple work streams that we need to orchestrate Uh, over the course of this discussion um, I, i will also try to elaborate on how this needs to be done what could be the multiple entry points but yes ran uh, long story short in summary uh, it is much much more than migration and it's more of a modernization exercise for us it's a really helpful perspective to kind of put it all in context i understand that brillio and aws are collaborating on a data warehouse modernization program what can you tell me about that and let's hear from martin on this one Well, so let me start by um, you know addressing first. I'm going to address what we see as data modernization, right? I mean, um, Rahul right now covered the the process of migrating from a traditional or an on-prem technology to to the cloud, right? But he also said something um, something um, he used the word the the art of the possible. right the phrase the art of the possible um at aws um we see this opportunity when you migrate from an on prem technology in this case a data warehouse over to the cloud as an opportunity to improve and modernize the the flow of data so let me put it in this perspective we have a very competent very modern solution for data warehousing which is redshift So if if a customer just wanted to leverage and move their data warehouse on prem to to the cloud and and just keep doing things the way they are doing them essentially right as far as the way data is being centralized in the data warehouse um now have it in redshift and take advantage of the many different uh features that cloud technology offers well that is certainly possible but 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 customers can go beyond that right and this is where where i again readdress what rahul said the art of the possible and this is where where um, our uh, trusted and our advanced partners like relio bring um their knowledge to reimagine to redesign how the data analytics um 
environment can take advantage of new technologies, not only the data warehouse. So um, if we go, for example, to a slide that I have in, um, that I have there prepared for you guys, where it essentially shows what it is kind of a traditional approach on data warehousing, which was still using the data warehouse as, as a silo, right? The data warehouse as a silo, um, you could essentially do the same in the cloud, right? I mean, there are many other data warehouse platforms that allow you to run in the cloud, right? But they still pretty much follow the same approach of concentrating, of, of storing all of the data inside um, the data warehouse. And that in itself is a silo, right? Because we were talking about data democratization, we were talking about ubiquitous access, multiple services taking advantage of the data. But if you go and put your data again in a silo, such as the data warehouse, then you are essentially going over at the same challenges. What happens when you have a new, a new technology, a new tool, a new service, like let's say something like machine learning that wants to use that data, it will have to go and talk to your data warehouse, right? Because your data is encased in the data warehouse. Um, if you want to open the data for other areas, you will have to connect to the data warehouse. So the, the data warehouse essentially becomes a silo. And, and not that it's wrong, but it's kind of the, the traditional way things have been done over the last 30 years. You could have a data warehouse in the cloud and still follow the same pattern, right? And this is where the art of the possible that Rahul was saying and, and the, the, the opportunity to reimagine the, the analytics platform um, can take place. And this is where we, with our technologies, and when I say we, I'm talking about AWS, when AWS with their technologies, the way we design the approach, the way we add features to, in this case, our data warehouse solution, which is Redshift, opens for a set of possibilities. And where our partners with experience like Brilio can come and help customers to take advantage of this vision, of this way of doing better, of modernizing the data platform. So from the left where you have the typical data silo, which is the data warehouse, what we propose, what we support, what, what we, um, let's call advocate, is the concept of a data modernization strategy, where instead of having the data warehouse being the center of the data storage, right? for analytics, we propose to use the data lake. And this doesn't have to be done from one day to the next one. It can be a process where you move first into your traditional approach with the data warehouse, but you start taking advantage of the integration with the, with the data lake technology, right? So for, for example, um, you can start landing your data in, in the data lake and then that data, you can ingest what it makes sense into the data warehouse, whatever it is, it is convenient to keep in the data warehouse due to the nature of a data warehouse, um, um, let's call it pro perfor performance, right? Um, but instead of, again, of having the, the data warehouse at the center of all, we propose to have an ubiquitous, uh, accessible, open standard, friendly technology, which is the data lake, right? And the data lake is a concept. Right, you can use different technologies to, to build a data lake. In this case, we propose S3, which is our object storage, because it is it, it's it's the many different features and advantages. Among them, the fact that it, it is created to be easy to access but robustly secure. Right, the the fact that you can set up above it, and and again, I, I will quote Rahul again. Right, governance. Right. This, the, the fact that you can set up governance around the data lake. So um, in summary, this is the possibility of redefining the way you are doing things to modernize your platform, not only from a data warehouse aspect, from the, for, from, but for your complete data, warehouse, the data analytics platform. And again, having the data in, in, in the data lake, you need to build features that allow, in this case, the data warehouse technology, which is Redshift, to, com to communicate with this, this data store. Now, not only that one data store, there are other services and other data stores as part of this, of this, let's call it ecosystem, right? And we have built also federation capabilities into Redshift to be able to communicate, to run queries, right? To federate queries 
to other databases, right? So in, in all, our data warehouse technology doesn't aim at becoming a silo. It aims at being a great data warehouse that has the capability to integrate with other services. So in the process of a migration, right? When you are moving from the traditional data warehouse, maybe an on-prem, and, and, and they're starting to take advantage in, of the cloud technologies, this redefinition of what you can do with the, the, the cloud technologies is key. And, and again, I, was, I had been mentioning that we have created features in Redshift that allows Redshift to take advantages of the technology and integrate with these other, other, um, other services, right, and tools. So further down, I'm going to talk more about specific features of Redshift and especially what we have done in the architecture of Redshift over the last um, eight, seven, eight years to be capable of continuous, continuing improve, improvement, right? Um, under this kind of architecture. Um, so again, essentially, this is what we are seeing. This is what is the art of the possible. And, you know, again, migrating the data warehouse is an opportunity not only to move from, from on-prem, but to redefine how you take advantage of your data with the right architecture. Thanks for that. My next question comes back to use cases. Uh, the path to success starts by optimizing technology for real business use cases, not technology for technology's sake. Why does one undertake a movement to a new data architecture? And how do you go about helping clients define those use cases to ensure the optimal technology design? Martin, what are your thoughts? So, um, again, the, the way we design technology uh, at AWS, so for us at AWS, our number one leadership principle is customer obsession, right? So when we build solutions, we do it working backwards, thinking what is that the customer needs? The customer should, should be the center at the center stage of why do we build it, the features in the technology that we build? Now, we don't, we don't build technologies necessarily to respond to the market or the competition, but we want to do it for the customers. And sometimes that may, may look like we are adding something when others are you know, building another kind of feature, but because we're looking ahead, right? Let me, let me explain. So as I said before, with Amazon Redshift, we, um, we want to provide a technology that allows you to unify the data that comes from different sources and they are located in different sources. We have we know that customers, we have seen with customers, we have talked to customers and, and they want to have ubiquitous access to the data. They want to be able to use their data in more than in more use cases, right? In more, more rich way and do not necessarily have to be tied to what the data warehouse can provide. So we have evolved the features of our technologies, right? Of our solutions, in this case, Redshift, to address these requirements and be able to cover for more use cases. Um, I was talking a minute ago about, about the possibility that Redshift has to, to query data directly from, from S3. Uh, this feature is called the Spectrum. And with Spectrum, you can access data um, that, is, uh, that is allocated in S3, then, and, and Spectrum will allow you to have exabyte scale data uh, performance. In other words, your queries can access large chunks of data, even an exabyte level uh, with good performance directly from the data lake. Not only structured data, but also semi-structured data, right? Um, if we go ahead and talk a little bit about, about the evolution of Redshift, right? There, I have a slide that talks about the Redshift architecture evolution. You can see how we have designed Redshift. And I'm not talking about specific um, about the, the every single feature that we have added to Redshift because just over the last two and a half years, we have added more than 200 new features, right? But let's go over a quick, a quick review of how Redshift evolved. So we, um, we um, made Redshift generally available in 2013. At the time, the first cloud data warehouse managed service. And again, back then what we saw is customers wanted to have a data warehouse that was more elastic, that was that you were going to pay for what you used and that you wanted to have less 
um, let's call it, let's call it less management um, around the technology. So the Red Shift was a, as immediate success with thousands of customers adopting Redshift because we made data warehouse easier than what it was at the time. Not only we were taking advantage of the cloud technologies that allow for, for you know, um, elasticity, scalability, uh, but also we made it easier to manage compared to the technologies that existed at the time. Um, that was an immediate success. But Redshift was still based on what we could call on what we define as an as a massive parallel processing technology and MPP technology, right? With a share nothing architecture. Because that was kind of a the data warehouse technology, the data warehouse architectures at the time. So from 2013 to 2017, we started to notice that customers wanted that kind of ubiquitous access, that their use cases demanded for data democratization, for more, more use cases to be covered with that existing data, more tools to be used, and more different and different um, user communities capable of, of, of accessing this data. So we added this capability of querying data directly from the data lake, which for us, as I said, the data lake is that perfect storage because it allows for ubiquitous access under an open, open a standard, um, standard uh, environment, right? Um, so we provided Redshift with this secondary engine that we call a Spectrum. Redshift a Spectrum is, Spectrum is a feature of Redshift, which is essentially a serverless technology that allows for fast access um, to data lying in the data warehouse, in the, in the, sorry, in the data lake, in the form of, um, of external tables. So it's essentially querying data that is outside of, a, of the data warehouse database because you can read the, the, that data in the form of external tables and even join it with data that you have inside your database, right? And again, that came from the need that our customers had to be able to query data that doesn't necessarily have to be ingested in the data warehouse. Um, then in 2018, we address the, the, the requirements that customers had about the database being intelligent at resizing itself, providing more, so the data warehouse, not the database, the data warehouse to resize itself by adding more compute resources uh, as needed. And so this usually happens on high concurrency peaks and this auto uh, scalable compute, we call it concurrency scaling. And it allows Redshift to automatically add more compute resources under high concurrency situations as needed. And then once that, that need passes, uh, release these compute uh, resources. And that was added in 2018. In 2019, we, we addressed the need that customers had to be capable of the data warehouse itself to auto scale, right? So we gave uh, in 2017, the possibility of accessing data that was not inside Redshift, right? Inside Redshift tables with Spectrum. But then the data inside Redshift, customers wanted to have the separation of the storage and compute to have pretty much unlimited scaling and the storage side, right? When the data was stored in Redshift. And we addressed that with, with our new um, generation of Redshift clusters, the RA3 nodes. We separated storage and compute. And now you can store a large volume of data, right? And keep adding more data without having to add more compute to your cluster until you really need to. And then in 2021, we allowed multiple Redshift clusters to be capable of sharing data, right? So this data sharing capability enables you now to have multiple clusters, some clusters can be specific for certain workloads, right? And you can turn them on and off as needed and share that databases with other clusters. We also added an additional compute capability at the storage layer, we call it Aqua, for queries to be faster when they need to read a lot of data from the from this separate storage layer. So, so I, I wanted to cover this evolution uh, briefly so you you can see how is that we have been adapting redshift to the requirements of our customers to the needs for to cover for new use cases and to make sure that redshift stays um stays 
relevant to the needs of our customers so they can use it um, to tackle down all the different use cases that these new architectures like the lake house uh, based architecture open to them right and in the next slide there is a, a quick definition of some of the most relevant features because this is this was pretty much explanation on how we have evolved the architecture of redshift in the next slide um, there is a definition of what are some of those features of redshift that you know um are relevant to most of our customers, right? Um, I'm not going to go through every single one of them because I am conscious about the, the, the time limit that we have in our conversation. But um, as you can see, we have added features to Redshift like easy to use SQL machine learning, uh, SQL based machine learning. So you, you can create and train machine learning models directly from Redshift, right? Uh, using simple SQL and queries, queries that can read data that is allocated in Redshift or maybe data that is allocated outside of Redshift in the data lake, right? We have added more self-tuning capabilities to Redshift to make it easier to use. And so, uh, again, addressing the question that you made in the beginning, and this is the reason why I wanted to go through these slides, we are continuously evolving Redshift to be more capable to cover for more use cases that our customers demand. Um, I don't know if Rahul will want to add more to that, uh, but returning the, 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 the question to you, right? Sure, sure. Thanks a lot, Martin. I think that is really, really uh, detailed. Uh, what we are also seeing, Martin, I think, uh, well, you spoke about uh, certain technical patterns, which has led to uh, you know the evolution of Redshift, and that is directly uh, a correlation of how the end users are also uh, utilizing the data um, on Redshift. What we are also seeing uh, from our end, uh, I would call them as patterns, right? As in, we are seeing certain patterns on how customers are utilizing Redshift. Uh, from an architecture standpoint, right? So if you, if you look at how, let's say, the the pattern of how an organization is shifting to Redshift, uh, we definitely see three different uh, three different areas, right? So the area number one or pattern number one would be uh, an organization being reactive uh, to to uh, utilizing Redshift, right? So in that case, what happens here is you will have an organization which has a legacy data warehouse and it is nearing the end of its life. Um, licenses are currently you know, bought for, but there is a shelf life to those licenses. Uh, the, the warehouse is also nearing capacity, right? So typically in that scenario, what we definitely see, organizations typically use Redshift as an EDW offload. So what they would do is point the curation and storage and curation of data from their legacy to the uh, Redshift instance, which will be used to process and hold the data and point it back to the consumption layer, which is on premise. Um, that we feel uh, is, is an introductory step that organizations take, take as on when they have to uh, modernize um, their data warehouse on Redshift. <clears throat> what we definitely also see is, is organizations who are living in uh, both the cloud and on-premise, right? So you have organizations who have slowly but surely matured, let's say, a few of their business applications on cloud. Let's say, uh, you know, uh, PeopleSoft going to HCM, um, or let's say their current sales uh, application, they're uh, moving to Salesforce, right? So all of that uh, happening also gravitates and ensures that there is a need for the data gravity to also move to cloud, right? So in this case, what we typically see organizations utilize Redshift from a perspective of doing fast BI because these applications are already on cloud and the users who are also using these applications predominantly tend to be little more data savvy. They would want to leverage Redshift from those aspects, right? To be the layer for any kind of fast BI. And that's where when you mentioned Spectrum, uh, we definitely see organizations who are leveraging uh, and who are living in these, uh, these the, the on-premise and also the AWS construct tend to use Redshift Spectrum a lot to drive a lot of consumption for their through their end users. Uh, what we see also as the final pattern 
are organizations who are completely on cloud, right? So the the uh, capital ones of the world who have completely shifted to cloud, they are utilizing Redshift to drive their end-to-end -end consumption, right? So none of it stays on-premise, everything is on cloud. And on cloud, uh, it, it's dictated by any kind of an architectural pattern, right? It could be a lake house architecture, uh, Martin, that you mentioned, or it could be, let's say, uh, a, a data warehouse, which is a centralized data warehouse, leading to many, many small exploratory, small exploratory warehouses, right? So it could be a number of patterns that we see within that, uh, with, within that uh, scenario where uh, the organization is completely uh, living on cloud, uh, not only its infrastructure and applications, but absolutely its system, core system of insight, which resides on Redshift, and it could be, uh, could have any kind of a, a technical structure, right? So be it a lake house or be it an exploratory warehouse or be it an operations warehouse, we definitely see organizations who are really, really mature and ahead of the curve utilizing that uh, as, as an adoption pattern. I love that phrase you used, move the, move the data gravity to the, the cloud. That's a really nice way to phrase it. Let's talk about data democratization. Uh, one of the key benefits of moving the data warehouse to the cloud, how do the clients actually see this benefit? Martin, can you comment on that? Yes, of course. Well, so the, the benefits that customers see from uh, moving data to like their cloud data warehouse um, to a cloud data warehouse. And um, specifically data democratization is, first of all, customers can get insights of all of their data, right? So not only the data that they are returning from or, or receiving back from trans, um, online uh, transaction processing databases, um, but data that flows from different streams, right? Um, be it a, a web application, be it sensors uh, from an IO, from IoT devices, right? And their typical relational databases, they can get insights from all of the data. Again, that's the main reason why we want an ubiquitous uh, data store where, where the data lands first, being the data lake, right? And then through, through Redshift capabilities as a, as a, as a competent and, and very performant data warehouse, all these insights can be produced. Um, Another thing that customers want to have is scalability, elasticity, and flexibility. As I was saying before, pay for what you use. Use more, more resources when you need them. Add more compute when it is necessary, and then scale back when you are not using it, or even turn off the resources. Um, also, they, they, they want to have an increase in productivity, because when data is in a place where you know, all users and different solutions have access to, customers have a, a better way to access it. It's, it's easier to get there, right? And, and finally, all this has to be done being conscious of costs. One of the beautiful things about this, this type of technology, right? As I said before, I have been in this industry for 30 years. And I still remember when 15 years ago, 10 years ago, it was not long ago, really compared to the existence of data warehouses, when having a high-end data warehouse was a very pricey, um, so a very pricey, um, um, let's call it solution, right? I mean, having a, a technology of this kind just to get it through the door, as I think I stated earlier, used to cost you hundreds of millions of, uh, sorry, hundreds of millions, sorry, sorry hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars, two millions, right? So, I mean, the cheapest, the cheapest thing was like a couple of, hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Just to get it through the door, right? And then from there, you had to make sure that you were using it to justify the cost. And, and now with all these cloud technologies, which are scalable, which are elastic, you can turn on and off, you can add on demand. The main thing here is to make sure that all of them remain cost friendly, right? Um, so all these four, right? insights, elasticity, or being capable of producing the, the insights from all of your data, get elasticity and flexibility, increase productivity, and all this done under, under the right cost or approach um, are important, but also being safe, security, right? Because one of the main paradigms that, you know, usually our customers have to break 
is when I move the data from my site, uh, from my on-prem location to the cloud, I am afraid that it will be less secure. It's not under my control. So it's like thinking that I'm taking my money away from, you know, uh, from my, uh, my money vault at home, right? My safe at home. I'm putting it in a bank. So it's not anymore there where I see it. And now it's in a bank and I'm not sure that it will be safe, right? So it's kind of the same, same thing with data, right? The, the first fear to break here is I'm moving my data over to another place and I want to make sure that it will be safe. And there are many, many, um, unfortunately, uh, um, examples of situations where customers have been hacked um, directly on their on-prem um, data centers, right? Um, we could talk of some of the most the most sounded ones, but reality is that um, data is safe if you have the right infrastructure and the right people protecting it, not because you have it on your on your on your on-prem side, right? So that is important. So data has to be safe. You have to be you have to feel that you're putting your data in the right hands. And on top of that, that due to all the regulations, right, you are um, you are being compliant with whatever regulations your industry asks for. So all these five are important, right, for customers. That's really great. Thanks for that, Martin. My last question. Partners are often key for successful data warehouse migrations to cloud. It's rarely as simple as just telling the current team to make it work. How do you work with the current teams? What skills and accelerators do you bring as a partner? And how would you advise IT leaders to approach a migration given this tension? So Rahul, why don't you go ahead and take that one? Sure, sure. Thank you so much, Rand. Uh, so our, our point of view is, is that this does not have to be a big bang approach. We definitely believe in having a phased out plan and a strategy towards execution at scale. Uh, so if we have to modernize uh, data warehouses on AWS for our clients, what we typically do is take a very structured phase-wise approach to this problem statement. Uh, the first thing that we target is a time-bound exercise where we create the modernization strategy and the modernization plan for our clients. And that starts with defining the business case. Uh, so we also have a slide for this. So as on when we define the business case, and uh, this will come up very shortly on screen, uh, what we typically do is identify drivers for our clients on what could be the typical uh, uh, you know, areas of focus for them as on when they are taking this modernization journey on AWS. The business case definition also focuses on what could be the cost projection. Martin spoke about uh, you know, uh, uh, a legacy warehouse costing millions of dollars in, uh, in, in licensing on a year-on-year -year basis. What would be the cost projection that we provide to clients on a year-on-year -year basis, especially because cloud is such an evolving landscape. You are adding services, you are changing functionalities, you are adding more functionalities on, on uh, specific services also like Redshift, right? So what is the cost projection becomes a very, very important consideration um, uh, in order to decide uh, what should be the adequate and applicable journey or let's say the modernization journey that we take uh, for a data warehouse on AWS. Uh, once we are past that, right? And once we have, we have been able to explain the problem statement and articulate it and get business buy-in, it is important for us to determine uh, two things. Uh, what is that we are going to take to cloud and how we are going to take that to cloud and where uh, would that finally reside in. So I mentioned two, uh, but if you actually look at it, we are actually addressing three main key areas, right? So which is uh, through the data discovery and the workload analysis and the architecture assessment that we do. Uh, again, it all comes as part of the strategy and migration planning exercise, but these are very, very key uh, focus areas for us, right? So for us, a data discovery and a workload analysis would help us to determine the inventory of all the data, all the workloads, all the reports that have to be taken to cloud. Um, and, and that helps us also in the migration roadmap planning because 
as part of this inventorization that we do, we will also determine what is hot data, what is warm data, what is cold data, right? So if something is hot, critical, very, very closely tied to the BAU, we would not want to target that as part of the first sprint of migration that we do because it's very, very closely tied to the business. But if something it is, uh, if, so, if some data set or subject area is, let's say, warm, and it is less critical, we would definitely target that for sprint one, right? So that that is definitely something that we are certain as part of the workload and the data discovery analysis that we do. The, the architecture assessment helps us to determine what would be the applicable targets on AWS, right? So we know Redshift is definitely one target, but if we have to follow a lakehouse architecture, what resides on S3? Um, what do we put on Redshift? what would be the applicable services that we use to ensure that we are doing orchestration, the curation is happening, we have applicable governance. So all of that is uh, done and finalized using the architecture assessment. And using these two as outputs, we then proceed to the migration roadmaps uh, and, and the migration planning, which is where we clearly chart out how will the migration happen with respect to the data, the workloads, and on what targets will it actually happen, right? So the sprint one, sprint two, and the multiple sprints that we define thereafter is all determined as part of the migration roadmap planning that we do. So all of this, all of this is a time-bound exercise that we that we perform with our clients. And, and this is what we call as the modernization strategy, um, the migration planning exercise for a warehouse uh, to be moved to AWS. Post that actually is the long drawn out uh, migration execution at scale, right? So it is not only just migration, like I mentioned earlier also in the talk, uh, it, we have to handle multiple work streams, right? So how do you ensure multiple work streams get initiated, get actioned upon as and when required? You definitely need an execution office. So we definitely believe that an overarching governance, overarching program management has to be provided by this execution office. And through this execution office, I will initiate multiple work streams. So number one, obviously, is the migration uh, work stream. And as on when I do my sprint one, my sprint two, I move to industrialization using a pod model. That is definitely number one work stream in our mind. But how will the migration take place if there is no platform? So we definitely need a platform stand-up team, which will ensure that whatever are those components that I have determined from the architecture assessment are made ready, made available for the migration team to start work on. At the same time, we have to ensure that this platform standard team, stand-up team also works to create higher environments, right? So the migration initially happens on a dev environment, but we also have to ensure that as on when we have to move our code, our services, all of this is all of this is done in a structured manner. We use typically, uh, you know, uh, AWS DevOps services to do this. Uh, so either we uh, we'll end up using CloudFormation templates or we'll use CDK pipelines to ensure that we are moving services and code in a seamless manner uh, to higher environments. And that comes as part of the data DevOps and the data ops that we orchestrate on AWS, which is again a separate work stream. Uh, the important work streams that I want to highlight later on are the data management and the data operating model work streams, right? So these two are superbly critical because uh, the first one addresses how do you ensure that data on AWS on Redshift is reusable, it's repeatable, it's trustworthy. So management of data on AWS and governance of data on AWS is established through functional uh, work streams and also through technical. So we need to ensure that there is technical governance because data needs to be accessible to applicable personas and that we will build as part of code. We will ensure that we encrypt the data using KMS. But at the same time, uh, if I move my attention to data operating model and change management, it is basically impacting way of work how people work on AWS is also an important consideration for us, right? Uh, and as part of the execution office, we need to partake on an activity which will ensure that we are dipstick on, on what is the current capabilities, right? So if you have users who are more SQL minded, uh, would they be uh, 
okay working on a jupiter or a python notebook right uh, that, that 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 is a conversation that needs to be had if your users are typically sql minded and you would want to use sql itself can they start using athena and can subsequent training sessions for them be conducted uh, so that change of way of work change in way of work is superbly critical and all of that gets orchestrated through a data operating model for us and and finally i had also touched upon this in my earlier uh, uh, earlier when i spoke about it is how do i ensure that the on premise is cut off right so as on when i migrate and i move to the industrialization phase of my migration i need to ensure that i'm cutting off my on premise so that slowly but surely i'm completely removed from on premise and the data warehouse completely is uh, uh, modernized on redshift right so that for us is the end to end of it uh, but once all of this is done you need to also ensure that you have continuous operations and continuous delivery on aws right so that is where data devops data ops like i mentioned initially also comes into picture once the migration execution is done right so that for us is this end to end approach and in this whole end to end approach end to end journey the transformation that is happening that i spoke about we use a lot of our in house accelerators which is powered by the brilio.1 platform that we have so it's a proprietary platform that brilio has built as a digital first organization we definitely believe these kind of transformation exercises should be ex expedited uh using use of technology use of accelerators homegrown assets that we have and and we have assets which will target each and every one of these work streams uh which you see uh either on the strategy and migration planning or at uh, or in the migration execution at scale so we drive strategy and migration planning through a discovery asset that we have built which looks at uh You know, legacy data warehouses understands what's the scroll of data, scroll of data, and gives out applicable insights. Uh, we target migration migration execution through through uh, migration assets, be it let's say a, a data movement asset, or let's say a data validation asset, or let's say a data DevOps or a data uh, data ops asset on AWS. We have four assets for each of these focus areas. Um, and as on when we move to conversations around data management and data governance uh, specific to areas around data security because that's what organizations want the the uh, the confidence that data would be secure on aws as on when we put it there we have multiple uh, assets to ensure that specific to services that you create that you orchestrate on aws uh, let's say with respect to let's say data compliance with respect to data security at rest with respect to data classification with respect to data loss prevention we have applicable assets for each of these and and that's how we ensure that this journey is uh, orchestrated in such a fashion that it provides operating efficiencies to the client and and all of this is executed through our brilio.1 platform we have been doing this for multiple clients uh, so uh, there there is a customer story that i also have and 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 in that customer study we have actually done this uh, i would not say end to end but we have touched a lot of these uh, focus areas because all of this depends on on how the client also wants to partake on this journey right so uh, this this was a, a a leading utilities energy provider uh, who came to us with a key problem statement and that problem statement was how do i modernize my teradata so so we started first by asking do you really want to modernize uh, your teradata or do you want to uh, you know take it to a next gen platform and that next gen platform definitely should be and could be aws right so there was a discussion that we had where we helped them through out of the possible conversations through through a poc based approach to first understand if aws would be the target cloud platform for them and as on when that was justified and that was validated Uh, with the client uh, we we took them through an architecture definition uh, exercise where the objective from our end was basically to define the components of that end to end architecture on aws so, so be it with respect to ingestion on how the data would be ingested what would be the components of data uh, of the data ingestion strategy um, with respect to the data curation strategy how will the data reside within let's say the data lake that we build on aws and then finally 
how will the data be provisioned and published on Redshift? Because Redshift for us was always going to be the target, uh, the, the end target, right? So how will the data or let's say the applicable data for consumption be utilized or let's say be stored on Redshift, right? So this whole logical progression of data starting from the data residing in the S3 buckets as part of the overall lake and then the final movement of the applicable provision data into Redshift, we were able to give visibility to the client as part of the architecture discussions. And then came the phased wise migration delivery that we did for this client, where we targeted low priority data sets uh, as part of the prioritization exercise that we did earlier. And those pri low priority data sets were first actioned upon for the migration sprints. And as on when the client saw the benefit of this data being moved slowly but surely to the data lake and then to Redshift, uh, the, there was greater confidence, greater operating efficiencies, greater reusability in terms of processes that we built in. And all of that ensured that over a period of eight months, we were able to completely move that uh, legacy teradata to a data lake and finally put the provision data on Redshift. So this for us uh, uh, is, a, is a very, very good uh, customer story because we have done the end-to-end -end of it, right? So we have tackled the complexity of the data through the discovery that we have done. And if you see, uh, we have also highlighted what was the data complexity. So we had around 800 database objects. We were handling multiple lines of business and we were actually looking at uh, a decent quantum of data. I will not call it huge volume, but a decent quantum, right? So it involved a discovery exercise. It involved an architecture assessment. It, then it involved the migration at scale, right? So again, to uh, finally summarize and again, getting back to your first question, right? Uh, is it a migration story? No, it is not. It is, it is an end-to-end -end modernization story. And that's how we believe that, uh, you know, a data warehouse modernization on AWS should happen. Martin, if you want to add anything. No, I mean, <clears throat> you, you covered quite a, quite a very good, um, you know, perspective on how how a competent um, and let's call it pain on well, let me call it close to painless migration approach takes right. And this is where it is important for us as AWS to rely on our advanced consulting partners like really experience and methodologies. Um, you know, they have seen. They have seen different types of customers. They have worked with multiple sizes of customers. And so they have defined methodologies that can adapt to, to the customer needs. So as you can see here, um, uh, my, this, the, a migration plan is not just, you know, let's move your data from one day to another. It requires a process of understanding the data that the customer has, their requirements, and how most effectively move the data while preserving an unparalleled, unparalleled access to the existing system until everything is ready. So no, certainly these competencies like the ones really has, which is you know, not only the migration consulting competency, but also you know, the architectural and DevOps competency coming to play. And again, this is where having a customer like Relio, which is capable and has those methodologies is important. They understand the customer, they understand the, the trends, and they understand the technology, in this case, our technology, Redshift, to, to make the most of it. So that's essentially what I, I will have to ask as to add. That's great. Hari, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Um... So I think um, this is a real example of um, how the blend of experience and tools, um, you know, between Brilio and AWS coming together and solving this business problems, right? I think that we heard that great story from Rahul and uh, Martin. I think um, uh, I think they covered pretty much everything. Uh, right? Okay. That's wonderful. Well, thank you guys for such a thorough discussion. I feel like we hit it from all sides. And thanks to those of you who tuned in. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.